I'm going to talk to you about my maternal grandfather, Liu Jitiao. And he's known as the father of Chinese art deco. Now, I grew up with my grandparents, but they never really spoke about China. My grandmother would be like, oh, your grandfather's famous. And we'd be like, yeah, yeah, that's great. And we knew he studied in Paris, but we didn't know much else past that. He was just gong gong, which means mother's father. And he was quiet and stern, and I was definitely afraid of him <laughs> when I was growing up. Um, but he was really happy when he was painting. And when he was about five, he started to show talent as a child prodigy. And at eight, he painted his parents' portrait. Portrait of his parents' painting. Okay, so that's what he did when he was eight years old. Okay. Now, he was born in 1900. So he was growing up during the Republican period, Sun Yat-sen, Chiang Kai-shek, to kind of give you an idea, the Nationalist Party. He was sent to Shanghai to study when he was in high school, and we figured this is around the time where he got his taste of Western art. This is the first time. And I was told that they only could see it in like photocopies, so only in black and white. And so when students were encouraged to go and travel during um, this time period, he decided to go to France. Now, a lot of students um, did go to America. They also went to Japan, a few other places to study. He ended up in France in 1919. Okay, that's his student ID. So he studied first at the Sorbonne, because you have to be fluent in French to go to L'Ecole de Beaux-Arts. And what else can I tell you? Oh, I found out that he traveled around Europe before he settled down and started studying. And he lived in Berlin for six months. And this is funny because I found this out. I was so excited. I yelling down the, the hallway to my mom. And she comes in. She's like, oh, yeah, he climbed, he, he, he climbed the Alps after he got his appendix out the next day. And then she turns around and she goes and cooks dinner or something. And I was just like, this is how I did all my research. I would just throw something at her and she'd say something really weird and then she'd walk away and I'd have to write it all down really quickly. Okay, I'm going. Okay, so he went to the Col de Bois Art in 1922 and he was under the tutelage of Ernest Laurent, so he was going to study painting. But like all college students, in 1923 he changed his major. <laughs> And so he thought architecture is kind of cool. And you'll find a theme going through architecture as fine art. And he was really interested in the idea of three-dimensional art. And um, to give you an idea of what's happening in China now, architecture as art or architecture as personal expression was not really happening yet. It was kind of a new concept because all the designs were done by the government. It was designs were handed down by treatises from master to student to master to student. And if a building needed to be built, it was just built. The roofs were all the same. The buildings were all the same. Just the measurements would change. So this idea of personal expression uh, was definitely a Western concept. So at the time, there were about 20 to 25 Chinese students in Paris. And they formed two complementary yet competing groups. And you've got my grandfather's friends who want to embrace modernity. They want to take Western ideas and meld them with Eastern ideas to create new art. And then you have the other group which wants to hold on and promote the traditional Chinese ideas, art, and everything that China stands for and to teach the rest of the world what China was about. Okay. And so in order to get that idea out and, and to kind of push that through, they did what is a precursor to the Paris Exposition in Strasbourg in 1924. And my grandfather did this poster. It's huge. It's at the Lyon Library. And you'll start to see how it plays with the calligraphy and it becomes part of the whole design. And these are some of the things that he has displayed at the Strasbourg, which is cool. This is from our family album. I found it published in another article, but it's flipped. So I was like, I have the original photo. Okay. 
And so you started to see a little bit of the melding of East and West here. You've got the peacock, very Art Nouveau, Western uh, symbolism, and of course the Chinese ladies. Now, one of his friends, Lin, Lin Fo Mian, argued that the shortcomings of Western art are exactly where the strength of Eastern art is, and vice versa. Complementing each other will make it the world's new art. And that, of course, brings us to Paris in the 1925 Expo. So not a lot of people know this, but China did have a section, and it was in uh, the Grand Palais. And unfortunately, Moving forward here, they did not get the government support that they really had hoped for. China was in the middle of a civil war, when were they not? And um, like Japan got a lot of government money. So what they did was they had to rely on import expert firms from, uh, from Paris, London, and Shanghai to raise funds for them to do this installation. And of course, remember those two groups of Chinese that were, were there, a lot of tension happened because one wants to do traditional, one wants to do modern. What do you do? So they ended up deciding, okay, we'll do a little of both. But because my grandfather um, was the designer of the actual installation, we have a more hybrid, modern fusion feeling to the entrance of, of the uh, installation itself. So again, you'll start to see the dragon and the peacock coming around here. And this is the catalog that they did just for our section. And again, the dragon, the peacock, and he starts to play around again with the, the calligraphy. Now this piece is a, it's a catalog about Yo Big, and it is in the uh, Getty, Getty Institute in Los Angeles. And it was actually one of the first pieces of art that we discovered that predated his time in America. We had no idea he had done any of this, and it was, it was just a crazy day. Um, Long story short, um, my, mom, my mom cried because later on she said the whole experience was, was really surreal. It was like meeting my father for the first time, but he was a totally different person. And if it's, he's 25 years old now, okay? She knew him when he was 40 and above. Okay, so this is the, ba um, this is the back entrance. So you do see some of the traditional Chinese lanterns, things like that, coming from the back. Now, my grandfather graduated in 1927, and his father asked him to come home. It's time to you know, do your duty for your country. And we think he wanted to stay. There is a rumor that he had a French girlfriend, and we found a postcard that was signed, Hugs and Kisses, Simone. And but he did return. He returned to, to, uh, to China, and his friend Lin Feng Mian, who he had been with in Paris, who was friends with the president of, of Peking University, Tsai Yuen-Pei, had a project for all of his French friends. So Tsai Yuen-Pei wanted to model the Chinese education system along France's educational system. So he asked Lin Feng Mian to be the director of a new school. And in 1928, the first fine art university and graduate school was built in China. And it's now the CAA. It's located in Hangzhou. And it's the Chinese Academy of Art. And Lin Feng Mian was the president. My grandfather was the dean of design. And they wanted to still get out this idea that Eastern and Western can meld together and make something new and, and stronger. And in order to do that, they needed to <coughs> spread the word, get that out there. And, and there's several ways they did this. Uh, one was the school, education, and the other was exhibits. So they hosted several international exhibits where they um, invited international artists from France, from Japan, from all over who they had met when they were students. Um, let's see. Can you identify your grandfather? Oh, yes. Let's see. He is... The one on the far left. He's always on the outside. Okay. Now, all of these guys studied in, in France, and they even brought um, a French uh, professor over, Andre Claudeau, who's in the middle there. One of the babies was still alive when I was doing this research, but she was in her 90s, and she lived in Xi'an. 
Okay, so along with teaching and being the Dean of Design, my grandfather was also working on something else, which was the Westlake Expo of 1929. Again, from the Paris Expo, they learned you can get, you can reach the masses, basically. So he worked for six months. He and his students worked for six months doing this, and he designed the, this logo postcard. And again, you can see how he's playing with the calligraphy uh, on the design. This is a rendering that we have in our family album of the, the entrance itself. And this is the actual entrance that they built. This is another entrance, a more modern entrance. Now, when I visited, there is a Westlake Expo Museum. And what I discovered there was that, you see our, our entrance here, is actually the same entrance. You go in traditional, and as you leave, you have modernized. That's pretty cool. I, I, for the longest time, I thought it was two different entrances. I'm just going to flip through some of these other images, and then the actual. This was the first Westlake cinema. Now, the next thing that another prong to this whole thing is publication, magazines. Let's get that out also. So along with everything else, my grandfather was designing magazine covers. He was uh, a writer. He wrote several articles. Several articles were written about him. This is actually a cover of a magazine that did a special edition that was all of his work. And the, the top line is the name of, of the magazine, Gongxian. And then below it is the, um, the issue date uh, of when it was published. These are just some of the buildings that he proposed. Uh, the government at the time wanted to move the capital from Nanjing to Beijing. This was a shopping mall. And there must be dancing in my family. I was telling some people, my grandparents used to ballroom dance. My parents used to jitterbug around the living room and watch American Bandstand. And my brother and I ended up teaching swing dancing and performing in Hawaii for the longest time. So again, more magazine covers. And I love this because of the way he uses the characters as bubbles for the fish. Nineteen, it's probably around 1932. So there's several of them, so it's hard to tell. Actually, I can look up the dates at some point when I get closer. So amongst all of that other stuff, my grandfather had time to meet my grandmother and get married in 1932. They were very social. They still had a lot of government connections. They went dancing, they entertained, they went traveling. He started his own business. And so he imported a European car and wrote the name of his company on the side. And he would drive around all the muckety mucks and government officials uh, to advertise. He was also building our, our family homes in three different places. We had one in Nanjing, we had one in uh, Guangzhou, and uh, one in Shanghai. Um, during the Shanghai World Congress, I was able to go visit the Shanghai one where my mother was born. So this is a shot of the Nanjing house. My mom says it was huge. There was even a ballroom in it. Had like 17 rooms, two, two stories. It was originally two stories. Now this was taken in 1985 when my mom went back to visit. It originally was two stories. But someone built a, another story on top. A communist general took over um, afterwards and said basically he didn't have to pay rent because he built a third story on top. My grandfather loved to do mosaics. So you can see some of the stuff on the floor that he had done on the interior. This is a shot of the house in Guangzhou. And you notice all the scaffolding is bamboo. Now, in 1937, he did start working more for the government. He was pulled off his um, private projects to fortify the military forts um, because of the uh, Japanese invasion that was coming. And he became the lieutenant general, chief architect to Chiang Kai-shek. But eventually, after the Japanese invaded, don't quite know where he ended up going. A lot of professors ended up going inland to like Chengdu University, just basically away 
Nanjing, but he was back in Shanghai in 1942 because my mom was born in 1942. And she was born, like I said, in one of the buildings that he had built in Shanghai. And then her younger sister was born in 1945. Now, in 1947, my grandfather, my grandmother, and my mother left for America. And it was really just to go for nine months to a year till this whole communist thing blew over. And, and so, unfortunately, or fortunately, they left my youngest, uh, the youngest aunt, or the youngest sister, with her grandparents because she was only like less than a year old. And to go to travel all the way to America for that long, they thought was going to be too much. Um, so what happened really quickly was that they were on a plane leaving Shanghai to go to San Francisco. And a student of his who had become part of the Communist Party found him on the plane and said, the communists know you're on this plane and you better get off. And so they rushed him from the plane to the docks and he was put on a boat. And I have the manifest actually. And it had his name, their names are written in. It was that quick. And they took a, a boat for two weeks to San Francisco instead. So he was able to flee and get away um, before the communists found him. And so they went to San Francisco and they made their way basically all the way across the country, sightseeing and things like that. And they ended up in New York in the late 40s. Now, these are photos from my grandfather's photo album. And I love these because I get to see everything the way he saw it. Like I have pictures from Paris in the 1920s and I've got this. I've got that. And it's like kind of being in his footsteps, like following in his footsteps, but you can see through his eyes. I get, sorry, I get choked up all the time. So by 1949, they know they're not gonna go back. That's just how it is. So they're cut off from China. Their youngest daughter was left behind and they just make do. They end up on the Upper East Side in Yorkville on 82nd, no, 80. 85th between 2nd and 3rd, and they have a one-bedroom apartment. I went to visit uh, a couple oh, last year I went to visit. Um, so when I first started this, this um, research, my mother had been uh, diagnosed with cancer, and so this was also a labor of love for both of us, and every time I found something new, she would write something down and tell me how she felt about the new discovery. But I think it helped to really concentrate, and, and so this was her apartment. She loved New York. Uh, but they were up there, and we decided, I guess they decided to stay because he loved Berlin, he loved Germantown. It was more European, he, so that's why he didn't go to Chinatown. They eventually moved because their rent went from $60 a month to $80 a month, and that was just ridiculous. <laughs> and what does a Chinese person who doesn't speak English in the 19, early 1950s, who doesn't have his architectural license in America too. And in New York, you didn't have a lot of choices. It was really laundry or restaurant. And neither my grandfather or my grandmother could cook at all. So he bought and started one of the first automated laundry mats in that area. And actually when I went back, I went around looking for this, this location. It ends up, it's on 82nd Street and 3rd. And it's now a 7-Eleven. <laughs> and then one of his friends, like one of his Chinese friends who he used to work with in China, had this great idea that he said, you should sell all your laundry mats, because he had two of them, and buy a chicken farm in rural New Jersey, because that's where all the money is. So <laughs> that's what he did. He, he uh, bought a chicken farm in rural New Jersey. And can you imagine my mother hated it? She was like a teenager by this time. She could get anywhere in New York on a subway, and now she is like, the nearest neighbor is a mile away, and she's got to feed chickens, and apparently they bite. So, yeah. <laughs> and, okay, so, so 1953, that is when they, they actually moved moved over there. And unfortunately, because of the industrialization of, of agriculture. All those small little farms went bankrupt and out of business. And my grandparents were forced to do odd jobs at Asbury Park 
um, at the hotels. They became like massage therapists and, and just did whatever they could to put food on the table. And it took, it took a while for my grandfather to get back to what he loved to do. But in 1962, he started working for an architect as a, their draftsman, but he basically did all the designs. Um, and and um, and so he, he, did, he did some banks, he did a lot of renderings, he did a lot of restaurants, hotels, things like that. And he didn't, he, he didn't start really producing a lot of artwork until he retired, uh, soon after I was born in 1965. And I was one of the first portraits that he painted in 1960, oh, 1967. And then he became very prolific. So he was... We were about 45 minute drive away. Now he lived in Jackson, New Jersey. If anybody knows New Jersey, New York area, it's where Great Adventure is now. So, yeah, you know. Uh, but we used to, every time we used to come go over and visit, we play the game of find the new artwork. And I used to run around the house trying to look for it because every room, he had shelves and shelves of artwork and he'd had things hanging. He had a huge garage, he had four kilns. So he was doing ceramics, he was doing watercolors. He started teaching privately. He was doing small exhibitions in local museums. He went back to a more traditional uh, subject of, of Chinese art because I think he missed China and felt like he needed to represent more. But these are more of the modern ones that I picked. He even designed some uh, furniture, which I would love to build and put in my apartment. So my grandfather died in 92, 1992, and he predicted it. He said, well, my, my father died when he was 92 years old, and my great-grandfather died when, or my grandfather died when he was 92. So when he did die, he left us all of his work. And uh, what we did was basically we packed it all up and put it in storage for 20 years. Um, my mother, over those 20 years, because I was going to college, and all of that, she said, I think you're going to do something with your grandfather's artwork. And I would be like, yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's nice. And I did study. I was an East Asian studies major. I did that more on a personal journey. I wanted to learn Chinese. I wanted to visit China, meet relatives I'd never met before, and, and things like that. And about 10 years later, I, 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 a painting fell off my wall. And that's how everything started. I have these two paintings that my grandfather did, and they travel with me everywhere. And you have to understand that they were very poor when they painted. So this is mounted on really, really thin uh, press board. And what he did was he would put the painting on the top, but the press board, he would drill two holes, take regular string, tie the string around, knot it on each side, and hang it up. And then on the other side, he put the painting, and then he did all the framing and the matting himself with the silk. So as we go along year after year or decade after decade, the string frays, it breaks, and I just tie it back up again, and it's string, it breaks, and I tie it back up until one day I can't tie it anymore, and there's no way because that board is that thin that I could even put eye hooks or anything in on the top, on the back, without ruining that painting. So I'm like, I guess I have to put it under glass. Because, you know, protect it, it's getting a little bit yellow. But then I said, maybe I should scan it before I put it under glass. I'm like, that's expensive. But if you do a lot of them, it's less expensive. So maybe I should scan everything. And um, that's kind of how it started. I was talking to a friend and they're like, why don't you just talk to USC or something and see if there's graduate students who want to research this work. Maybe they would help you scan everything and have it become part of their permanent collection. Uh, you know, you never know. And, and so she wrote a letter of introduction and, and the, the librarians from USC came over. They came over with the manifest that I was talking to you about. And they're like, yeah, we found these articles on the internet. And I'm like, the internet. Um, and then and as we go through the research, more and more things are being scanned and put on the internet. The problem is that my grandfather must have a dozen different ways to spell his name. So there's the simplified character, the complex character, his French name, his other French name, his English, you know, his American name, um, and then other names that he went by along the way. So it was always fun trying to, to find him. So what I did, the internet, I found an article by Craig Clunas, who was an Oxford professor 
and it basically was called Paris, uh, Chinese Students in Paris between 1920 and 1924. And in there, my grandfather's name is in there, and I am just bouncing off the walls because I've never seen my grandfather's name in print. This was just so exciting. And at the end of it, he's like, and their names fell into obscurity, and we don't know what happened to them. And I'm yelling at my computer going, I know. I know what happened. And I wrote to this professor, and he's like, oh, my gosh, that was I wrote that in 1984. I don't do that anymore. But you should write to Nancy Steinhardt. At, you know, you can. She's still doing this. And so I wrote to Nancy Steinhardt, and she said, yes, that's great. You should talk to Jeff Cody, who's at the, Insti the, the, the Getty Research Institute. And it just happened that that catalog from the, the expo was at the Getty Research Institute. So he was the one who translated it for us because it was in French. He took us around. He showed us all of that. And then after that happened, because we really got along with him. Well, he, he calls us up and goes, I was just asked to do a conference in Paris on architectural exchange, and I'd like to do it on your grandfather. How would you feel about working on um, the presentation with me and coming to Paris? <laughs> oh, no, no, I couldn't. <laughs> you know? So we end up, actually, this is, we end up going to the Paris for the exchange. We meet some people. We meet the people who are at the Cité de l'Architecture. They are doing Art Deco made in France. And they're like, we would love to put your grandfather's stuff in the Shanghai section of our exhibit and put a section in the catalog. Would you like to translate that for us? And we'll translate it into French or write it for us. And, and so we got to do that and go back to Paris again. And this was us in 2013. That's my brother, Matthew. That's my mom. And that was like the last big trip she was able to go with us. So I'm going to move forward on my notes here. So really quickly, what I really like about the work I'm doing, I am the self-proclaimed family historian. And, and what I like is that I was able to give my mother back her father. Because before... Uh, well, she passed September of 2021. But before that, she had only known my grandfather when he had been in survival mode, beaten down. Everything, like all the things that were in front of him, all the dreams he had were put aside to survive. And he was depressed, he was angry, he was suicidal at times. It was some pretty hard times. And, and so that is the man she knew. And to, to research when he was 19, 20, 21, and, and 25 going forward, she's like, he's just somebody different. But she realized all the things that made him who he was, including the stuff that she knew about him. Um, she did, so all, you know, the young man filled with dreams of, of strengthening China, art and beauty. And Personally, I am really grateful for the time that we got to research the stuff together. And, and she would give me all these little tidbits once in a while and uh, working on the family history. I would report on our blog and then she would write how she felt about it as, as having lived through it. And, and so it's my mom and I put this in for her and now she's holding her first granddaughter. And I put that picture in because I want that coat and so if any of you see one, it's my. Now this, I am very happy to introduce the newest member of our family. This is my niece and my brother. She is eight years old now. That was taken a little while ago. But I'm very happy that she got to know her grandmother and will know the history of her great grandfather. Uh, recently, we were we, our, my grandfather's side of the family reached out to us. Now they are Hakka, so they're nomadic, and they started off in northern China and they came down to Guangzhou, Canton. But apparently, I have 500 people I've never met before who I'm related to. Now this came up. They, they live in Meizhou, China, and this came up um, probably the beginning of this year. And they're all like, "Come to China! Come to China now!" And I'm like, "I can't," but hopefully next year. Um, but his aunt, come see his ancestral home, your great-grandfather's ashes are here, that kind of stuff. So that was all very exciting. And so we hope to visit very soon. So in conclusion, when Lou fled China, his name did fall into obscurity. 
And I feel by telling his story and exhibiting his work and getting it all out there, I can reclaim his place in history a little bit alongside his other colleagues that still have a name um, as the founders of Chinese modernism. And I would like to leave you with this. And I tell everybody at the end of all of my speeches that I encourage all of you to talk to your kids, talk to your grandkids, talk to your parents, your aunts, your uncles, um, and sit down with them because it gives us a sense of history, something bigger than ourselves. And, and it also tells us who we are as individuals and as families. And I feel that's really, really important. Um, but most importantly, you need to label your photographs. <laughs> Again, thank you for having me. <laughs> oh. Right, one more thing. Um, if you'd like to know more, we do have that blog. I've got cards there, and if you just want to leave me your email, I can put you on our, our mailing list. And questions? You want to, anybody have? Yes, sir. What happened to your sister? What happened to my mother's sister? She did come to America about eight years later through Hong Kong, and apparently my mother wrote a letter to the senator to help him get her from Hong Kong to America. There's this picture of my mother, my aunt, and my grandmother at the airport, and they do not look happy. <laughs> uh, because, I mean, it's, it's like you've never known your sister. All you've heard is that you should be grateful you're in America and your sister was left behind. And here we are picking up her sister who she doesn't know. And it was just probably very scary for her and a very awkward reunion. Um, and I can imagine what my aunt went through. She, uh, we lost touch with her. They, they, don't, they didn't get along very well, so they drifted apart. Um, I do know my aunt. I mean, when I was growing up, we, we saw her a few times. And uh, I think she's in California somewhere, last I heard. Uh, do you know much about any of the architects that your grandfather worked for while he was in the States? Um, he only worked, did, do I know any architects that he worked with in the States? He was almost retired by then, and he basically just worked in New Jersey. So he worked for a Russian architect named Sergei, Sergei Patakov. And if you know Rova Farms in Jackson, New Jersey, he, he did the uh, revival of that church, and it was a Russian Orthodox church. So there were a couple of Russian Orthodox churches that he worked on. But Rova Farms was probably the, the most easily Googled one that's, that's out there. All right, well, thanks. Yeah, thanks. I'll be here all week, so.